series of lectures for upper division classical mechanics. The target audience for this uh, series of lectures is physics majors, although there may be some physics minors. The class that I am teaching has calculus, one and two as prerequisites and calculus three and differential equations as co-requisites. So um, that's how I'm going to teach this. I'm going to teach this assuming that you have seen a lot of the calculus, but that you probably need some refreshers. Um, and I'm assuming that you haven't had a matrix algebra class before um, or that you are taking it concurrently. I'm going to do a couple little math refreshers so you'll get a chance to have a bit of a boost whether this is totally new material for you or whether it is um, something where you're just refreshing yourself a little bit. Um, and let's start with what is the scope of classical mechanics. When we talk about classical mechanics we're talking about everything that came before the, um, before the early 1900s when we had two big developments in physics. We had relativity and quantum mechanics. So this is everything before relativity and quantum mechanics, specifically focusing on the motion of particles or composite objects. Um, we are not focusing on electricity and magnetism, but I do like to draw a lot of examples from electricity and magnetism. And the reason why I like to draw examples from electricity and magnetism is that we have found that our upper division physics students often are a little bit rusty by the time that they reach upper division electricity and magnetism. So we, I want to sort of provide some refreshers and also highlight that while we often use um, examples that involve gravity, this can be true in general, um, and there's nothing specific about gravity or projectile motion, um, that it's, you know, electricity and magnetism does the same things. Um, so we are usually talking about, um, okay, so I have told you that we're skipping quantum mechanics and relativity, and we're not really talking about electricity and magnetism. Why should you be excited about this course? I will admit, when I took upper division classical mechanics, I went into it thinking, I am not going to like this class. It's going to be all the boring stuff. I don't care about locks sliding down inclined planes or, or cans rolling down inclined planes. None of it excites me that much. But what I learned as I got into it is that actually, this class teaches you a lot of how you think like a physicist. So when you took your introductory physics class, you dealt with a lot of cases where um, we knew exactly how to solve the problem. It was kind of a canned solution. Like you knew you weren't going to encounter problems that we couldn't solve, um, which was both comforting and kind of boring. Um, and that's not how we work in the real world. So when you did the problem of a mass on a spring, well, how often do you simply just have a mass bouncing up and down on a spring, the simple, boring mechanical problem? Um, what you do in this class is that you start learning how to take real world situations and approximate them as problems that we can solve. And <clears throat> at least in the class that I'm teaching, we're going to teach you how to handle it when you can't solve it exactly by working on numerical solutions. Um, so I think of this class as think like a physicist. And this is sort of a milestone in your physics education because you're going to learn how to take situations that you don't know how to solve exactly. and piece by piece, step by step, figure out how you can take that and learn how to do something with it. Um, and I often go back and emphasize, just if you followed my introductory, introductory physics classes, you'll notice that I started with the basics and was very slow and methodical about how I solve problems. I often do that in this class. Um, the reason is that the basics are often anything but. Um, 
you have an intuition from your experiences in the physical world, and that intuition is often wrong. And the way that you counteract being misled by your intuition is to be slow, methodical, and meticulous in the way that you solve problems. Um, it's also important to very clearly state the assumptions that you are making as you proceed through the problem. Because we're not working um, in the nice, safe, little sphere where these problems all have solutions. We are now working in a certain situation where we don't have exact solutions. So how do we take that and do something useful? Um, we have to make assumptions. We have to state the assumptions that we are making so that it is transparent what, when our solutions might be incorrect. That's perhaps more important than finding the right, finding a solution is understanding when your solution will hold. Um, and that takes slowing down. This is not about finding the right answer. Uh, it's not about getting through as much material as possible. Uh, sometimes, now that first introductory physics class, at least in the United States, is really intense. It's a lot of material in a very short time. So it can sometimes feel like you're on a race. You're trying to get through as much as possible. When you are doing things, when you're doing the work of being a physicist, you're very seldom actually extremely constrained for, for time. There's no one sitting there going, you have to find the solution in an hour or else the bridge collapses. So you usually have more time, but it's really important to know those, um, those assumptions that you have made. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on highlighting that as we work through. Um, and another bit about my philosophy, you will notice sometimes I make mistakes on the board and I purposefully leave them in there. Yes, because I'm busy, but also because I think it's useful for you to see those mistakes, but also to see how I know that they are mistakes because you, dear watcher, are also human and no matter how smart you are and no matter how hard you work, you are going to make mistakes. So what I want to teach you is how to see when you have made a mistake. All right, um, with that, we will dive into the material. This is chapter one, Newton's Laws of Motion. There's a little bit of math review and I am going to introduce a lot of different notation. Um, if I'm teaching an intro class, especially for non-majors, I try to be light on notation, but my working assumption here is that you are a physics major. And even if you don't know the notation already, it's time to learn. Um, so I try to stick with semi-consistent notation. I have favorites. Um, I have a, I, I have preferred ways of writing things, but I do sometimes move back and forth between notation. Um, especially when changing between types of problems. And you have to understand it when people write it. So I'm going to dump it all on you, and you have to learn the notation. That's part of learning the class. All right, and I, let me also, a little bit about how this um, board works. What you are actually seeing is the mirror image. So I am looking at the board, and I can see and read what I'm writing, and it's the mirror image for you. And I'm pointing that out because when I do some things like cross products, I'm gonna flip it so it's not mirrored. Um, <clears throat> but just be aware that sometimes if the image looks a little bit funny, like I'm drawing a right-handed coordinate system from my perspective, you might see it as left-handed. Um, I'm gonna tend to leave it in there, um, but I will hi highlight it if it is important. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna do is describe something's position. Um, we describe it with its position in space and time, and we use vectors to describe its position. So we are going to, here I'm gonna draw my right-handed coordinate system, but you will see it as left-handed. X, Y, 
You, oh, you cannot see that X. So I'm going to move my coordinates just a little bit. All right, so we have some object. And it will be right here. We have a position vector. We will call this vector R. Um, R is semi-standard. And we will write that position vector R. I'm denoting R with a, as a letter with a vector with an arrow over it. And now the book, books will sometimes use boldface. I cannot write boldface um, on the light board. So I'm just going to leave it as a letter. Um, and then here is my favored notation for a vector. X and then my unit vector. A unit vector is a vector of length 1 along the axis. So this would be x hat, y hat, and z hat. And the way that I have drawn this, r has a length of much greater than 1. So when you multiply by a unit vector, you are not changing the length. Um, and we typically denote uh, unit vectors with a hat. So x, x hat, plus y, y hat, plus z, z hat. So this is one way of writing the vector r. You will also see uh, x, i hat, plus y, j hat, plus z, k hat. This notation tends to be the most common in engineering. I tend to prefer x hat, y hat, and z hat because it's very literal and it's very hard to get it confused. Um, also, we're going to work with coordinate systems that are not Cartesian. And then we will have the variable um, uh, with a hat over it to denote something in that direction. And we also will sometimes use x, and then we'll use an e, and they might have subscripts. So e x hat plus y e y hat plus z e z hat. And you will sometimes see this written with this type of bracket, x, y, z. And if it is a two-dimensional um, vector, then you will simply see, you will only see x and y. And sometimes you will see curly brackets. Um, and this particular notation, what's nice about it is that you can write this com compactly. I'm going to write it as a sum from 1 to 3. R sub i, e sub i hat. Now, there I've assumed that we have a three-dimensional vector. When we get to relativity, we will talk about four-dimensional vectors. And there is no reason when you talk about other types of quantities that you couldn't have additional vectors. If we're talking about space or space-time. You're looking at three, four or fewer, so two, three, or four. Um, but this is a little bit more flexible because it doesn't really inherently assume a coordinate system. Um, I tend to like the hat notation instead of writing them like this because with this, if some of these are zero, you don't have to write as much. Um, all right, so this is... Um, these are most of the standard notations. I am going to upon occasion, um, make a few notes about notation. I think I've remembered everything. I may introduce a little bit more later. All right, so now we're going to talk about the things that we can do with vectors, um, because there's many different things that we can do with vectors. 
um, we're going to start by defining a couple of vectors for us to work with. So we're going to define the vectors R, um, which we will call R1 x hat plus R2 y hat plus R3 z hat and S which follows the same form. And then we're going to do vector addition. R plus S. And, and this should be a review, but it's not bad to go over it. The other thing is that these definitions and making sure that you know what those definitions are, that when things get tricky and confusing, that is what's going to, what you're going to have to go back to. Um, so if we start working in non-Cartesian coordinates or, um, or you, sometimes you just get confused because the equations on the page look really overwhelming, go back to the basic definitions. So, when we have R plus S, we're going to take all of the things with the same unit vector um, and add them together. So, uh, there is, this, is this unit vector acts just like a variable if you're multiplying things. So, we have R1 plus S1, X hat plus R2 plus S2. See, I know what I'm doing, and I even have... Typos, R2 plus S2, Y hat plus R3 plus S3, Z hat. All right, that is how we do vector addition. Vector subtraction is the same thing. Now we have a negative sign in front of all of the components of S. So we have R1 minus S1, X hat plus R2 minus S2, Y hat plus R3 minus S3, Z hat. And that is subtraction. We can multiply by a scalar, C times R, C, this constant, just multiplies each of the components. So we end up with C R1 X hat plus C R2 Y hat plus C R3 Z hat. We have, a, we have two types of products we're going to talk about, the dot product and the scalar product. This, or sorry, the dot product or scalar product and then the vector product or cross product. So, the dot product or scalar product produces a scalar and the cross product or vector product produces a vector. All right, so for the dot product, we have R dot S equals R S cosine theta. Um, and I'll define, I'll show, draw theta here um, in a minute. This is R1, S1, plus R2, S2, plus R3, S3. If this is S and this is R, the angle between them is theta, and the dot product is cos R times the magnitude of R times the magnitude of S times the cosine of theta. So, the dot product is the projection of S into the R direction. So how much of S is pointing in the R direction um, times the magnitude of R. You can also define it the opposite way. The projection of R onto the S direction times the magnitude of S. So it is R, S, cosine, theta. Um, and then um, we can also write this in a more compact notation where we write, uh, let me switch back to my neon green so that I don't change colors here. 
If we want to write this in a compact notation, we can write the sum over the i of ri si. And when we start talking about what you might do in a broader sense, um, when we talk about introducing relativity or even moving to um, string theory where you're hypothesizing that there's more than four dimensions, you keep this notation. It's the product of the components in each direction. And the only thing that changes is the, um, is the sum, the, the magnitude of the sum. And then we want to look at the magnitude, the length of the vector. So, because all vectors have length and direction, what is the length of the vector? Well, you can do r dot r. That gives you the length squared. And then you want the square root of that. We typically note that with just an r. So when I get deep into the math, what I'm going to be doing is, if I mean the, the magnitude of the vector, I just drop the vector sign. Um, so r dot r um, is the length r. That is going to be r1 squared plus r2 squared plus r3 squared. Um, or you can also denote that as the square root of the sum over the i from 1 to 3, ri squared. All right, and now we're going to introduce cross products. Well, really, it's not an introduction of cross products. It is a refresher on cross products. When I teach intro physics, I don't make my students work out cross products the long way many times. I usually make them do it once or twice. I want you to know how to do it. Um, I'm going to stick with writing stuff down, not drawing, for the most part, because this is where the mirrored screen causes some consternation. I'm going to stick with my two sample vectors here. Um, now, the magnitude of r cross s is equal to r s sine of that angle between them. So if I have r and s, the sine, uh, the, the magnitude is the sine of the angle between them. So um, here, then we have the um, so then when you think about the direction, it's uh, the cross product always has to be perpendicular to both of the vectors. Uh, so uh, So um, this is where I'm going to use my left hand instead of mirroring the screen. So if you have R cross S, it's going to be, in this case, pointing towards me. Um, now I'm gonna, we're going to do it the long way. Um, if you have, now, I want to point out this geometric interpretation is really useful um, because one of my tagline is, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. You should never work harder than you have to. Um, and sometimes, now, sometimes what you do is you go, I know this, this should work, but I'm going to do it the long way and just be extra certain, but I'm going to double check my work here. And if I do the problem two different ways and I get the right answer, it's probably right. Now, it's not necessarily right. You can still be making the same wrong assumptions in both cases, but it is much less likely that you are incorrect if you do the problem two different ways and you are, um, and you get the same answer in both ways. Okay, um, so we have our cross product. We're gonna do this the long way, um, but if you notice, first of all, if two vectors are parallel, the sine of the angle between them is zero, 
and the cross product is zero. So anytime you have two vectors which are parallel, then and a vector is always parallel to itself, then the cross product is zero. So you then shouldn't do that. Another trick that you can use is that you can, um, if you have these two vectors, then you can use the unit components and just take the cross products of the unit vectors with each other instead of writing out what I'm about, the big ugly mess I'm about to write. I'll do an example afterwards that'll show why this can be easier. But we'll start with the big ugly mess. R cross S, you can note as the determinant of the following matrix. Now, technically, you're not really doing that. We can be a little uncomfortable with putting unit vectors in a matrix. Uh, I would ask you to, yeah, put a, put a star by that discomfort. There's a, you know, it's a, think of it as a mimetic device, a way of remembering what you were supposed to do. Now, in this class, at least if you are taking this with me, you at this point don't have to have matrix algebra. However, you might have had, you might be in matrix algebra. Um, I'm going to give a refresher video or a, a um, quick and dirty class in matrix algebra, almost everything you need for this class as a separate video. Um, if this is your first time learning it, that's okay. We'll walk you through it. Um, think of it as a way to remember how to do the cross product. Okay, so we're going to write our unit vectors as the first row of a matrix. Then we're going to write the components of the first vector, Rx, Ry, Rz. And then the component of the second vector, R, uh, Sx, Sy, and Sz. And then we're going to expand this. When you expand a, a determinant, what you do is you take the first, well, we're going to expand about the first row. So every time you switch rows, you change rows or columns, you change signs. So here, I'm going to put this as an X hat, and then you mark out the components that are um, the, the, that row and that column and write the determinant. So X hat, R, Y, R, Z, S, Y, S, Z. And then I'm going to move over. And because I move one, um, one spot, I change my sign. And I have a y, minus Y hat. And then I'm going to mark out those two. And I'm left with a two by two matrix. R, X, S, X, R, Z, S, Z, and then a plus Z hat, because I've moved one row over, and now I'm going to knock out those two, and I'm left with that two by two matrix. R, X, R, Y, S, X, S, Y, and there it is. And now, for a two by two matrix, I, to get that determinant, I take this times that minus this times that. You're always um, expanding your matrix until you get a two by two matrix. And then we have a rule that we simply memorize for how to handle a two by two matrix. So this is X hat, R, Y, S, Z, uh, minus S, Y, R, Z, minus Y hat, R, X, S, Z minus S, X, R, Z plus Z hat, R, X, S, Y minus R, Y, S, X. Okay, so I'm going to slightly rearrange the order here, and I'm going to put my unit vectors at the end. And I'll show you why. Because this is another way that you can memorize everything. I'm actually going to put the sign into there and have a plus, and my x hat is there. OK, so you always have first vector, second vector, unit vector. And if they go in order, x, y, z, 
then it's positive. So now you have x, y, z. That term is positive. x, let's see, z, y, are, so unit vector, first vector, second vector, x, z, y, and it's negative. y, x, z is negative. y, z, x is positive because here you can, you can rotate it. So x, y, z is positive. z, x, y is positive. And y, um, let's see, y, z, x is positive. If you can rotate them and it goes in order alphabetically, it is positive. If it goes the wrong direction, it is negative. Now let me show you another trick that will come in handy if you have a lot of zeros. Now, conventionally, we expand about the top row. Let me put a pin in this and say, if this is not making sense and you're just stuck here, you don't have to understand how to do it the way I'm about to show it. But if you're good, it's a useful way to remember. There's nothing saying that you have to expand about that first row. You can expand about any row or column that you choose. So if you have a matrix with a lot of zeros, you want to choose to expand about the matrix, with, or about the row or column with a lot of zeros, because that makes life a lot easier. You don't have to write as much. So let me expand about this row. So this is a plus, this is a minus. So I'm going to do minus Rx, and then I am left with x hat, z hat, s, x, s, z. And then I move one spot over, so it's a plus R, y. And then I am left with, let's see. I did this incorrectly. These should be y's. y hat. S, Y, because I should have done these two. And then, all right, plus, so I should always have an X, a Y, and a Z. So then I expand about this column. So now I have X hat, Z hat, and S, X, S, Z. And then I move over here. I have minus R, Z. And then I have x hat, y hat, s x, s y. All right. So then I can expand these, and it looks a little bit different, but I have negative r x, s z y hat minus s y z hat plus r y s z x hat minus s x z hat minus r z s y x hat minus x x s x y hat and i'm not going to finish multiplying all of that out i will leave it as an exercise for the student to show that you get the same thing both ways. By the way, when professors say that it is left as an exercise to the student or it can be easily shown that, that usually means that it takes several pages of ugly algebra. All right, we will work a couple of examples. I'm going to choose very specific R, S's and R, or R's, a very, couple very specific R and S values so that there are some zeros. So let's choose r equals x hat. Let's do 5 x hat. Let's put some numbers that are non-zero. r is 5 x hat. 
S is equal to 3x hat minus 4y hat. Okay, so the first thing I notice, this is in the x direction, that's in the y direction. They are both in the xy plane. My cross product has to be in the z direction. Uh, I can do that, I can tell that without doing any math, and I can tell that because the cross product is always perpendicular to both of the vectors. And there's no z component. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to see what it is, um, but that particular one happens to be easy. Now, let, uh, the way I can do this with unit vectors, r cross s is equal to uh, is equal to 5x hat cross three x hat minus four y hat. All right, x hat cross x hat is equal to zero because the cross product of a vector with itself is equal to zero. So that part is easy, that goes away. And then x hat cross y hat is z hat. So I take my constants out in front and I get a negative 20. And because x hat cross y hat is z hat, that is a negative 20 z hat. So look, I did that cross product and I didn't have to write an ugly determinant. Now, we're gonna do that same thing using ugly determinants, because we're here to learn. And as my quantum mechanics teacher told me and my fellow students many years ago, you have to hurt to learn. It's only a little true. Eventually you learn to like it. All right, so now we're gonna do R cross S and we are going to do the determinant method. X hat, Y hat, Z hat. Now I have a lot of zeros. So here I have a five, zero, zero, three, negative four, zero. We'll do the standard determinant method. So I have X hat, zero, zero, negative four, zero, minus Y hat, five, zero, three, zero, plus z hat, five, zero, negative, or positive three, negative four. By the time you've done 80,000 of these, you start writing this down automatically. When this is new, you will be a little bit slower. Okay, this one, zero times zero minus, minus a minus four times zero, is zero. So this term goes to zero. Here I have five times zero minus three times zero. This term goes to zero. Here I have five times negative four minus positive three times zero. So I have a negative four. Let's see if I, no, sorry, a negative, ah, my, yes, I can barely fit it in. Negative four, ooh. ooh just barely runs off the screen. So I have negative 20 z hat, which is the same thing that I got here. Now, we're gonna do the same thing, but we're gonna choose to expand about where there are a lot of zeros. Now, you will notice that there is there are two rows or columns where there are there is only one non-zero number. So a good physicist is a lazy physicist, I'm gonna to choose to expand about one of those. All right, this is a pot. I'm gonna choose this one. Positive, negative, positive. So I have, oh, let me not use my, let me use my blue. So I have Z hat, five, zero, three, negative, four, and then minus zero when I'm here. I move down so it's a minus and I am left with x hat y hat three negative four so that's zero and then I move down again and I get plus zero x hat y hat five zero. So I get the same thing negative twenty z hat. All right, 
Now I'm going to expand about this row. So positive, negative. So I get a negative 5. And then I am left with y hat, z hat, negative 4, 0. And then positive 0, x hat, z hat, 3, 0, minus 0, x hat, y hat, 3, negative 4. All right, these guys are clearly 0. Here I have negative 5 plus 0 minus a minus 4z. So I have negative 20z hat. All right, that's four different ways to do the cross product. Um, now, the other way that you could do it is that you could look and say, you could do it geometrically and say, well, if the magnitude has to be r, uh, the magnitude of r, the magnitude of s, times the sine of the angle between them, and then you can uh, figure out the direction by doing r cross s. But you would have to make sure that you have a right-handed coordinate system. So, five different ways that you can do the cross product. A good physicist is a lazy physicist, so you want to choose the way that is the least amount of work. All right, so uh, I just want to highlight, so because most of this stuff is review for you guys, it's not the first time you've seen it. What I'm going to do in the, um, in the description of the video is that I am going to highlight um, where my introductory lectures on this channel where I talked about similar structure subjects in case you want to go back and do the introductory lectures again. And you guys are upper division students now. Um, so when you took intro physics, at least I was a lot more forgiving when you screwed up vectors and scalars. You guys are upper division, so I expect you to, if I ask you for a vector, give me a vector. If I ask you for a scalar, Give me a scalar. Um, and you always need units. Now, when I'm working out sample math problems, I'm going to be a little, I'm not necessarily going to write units. But if you are answering a physics problem about the torque of some, due to some force on an object, or um, <clears throat> I am asking you uh, to tell me what the angular momentum of something is, it has a magnitude and a direction and units. So you can just sort of file somewhere when you are answering an exam problem. Make sure you tell me what its units are, or at least if it's unitless, it is good to write a little note that you know it is supposed to be unitless. Um, if it is a scalar, make sure you're giving me a scalar. If you are unsure, um, if I'm asking you, well, what is the force on this object? And you're not sure if the question is asking for the full vector force or if I was asking you for the magnitude. First of all, I try to ask questions on exams that are at least unambiguous. But when in doubt, ask a clarifying question because I expect my physics majors to give me a vector when I ask for a vector and give me a scalar when I ask for a scalar. So double check that because now, I might be a little more forgiving in the beginning. When you get past this class, your professors are going to be mortified if they ask for the potential energy and you give them a vector. Because that's not a vector. So be very careful. Um, all right. Now we're going to talk about differentiation of vectors. So I am going to write my sample vector. We're going to use r. r is x, x hat plus y, y hat plus z, z hat. And when we talk about differentiation, when we have 
dx dt, we define this as the limit as delta x goes to zero of delta x over delta t. We are looking at what something does, a small change in x, as you as divided by a small change in t, what does it do if you shrink delta t? Um, or, let's see, this, sorry, this should be delta t. As you shrink delta t, teeny tiny small. Um, what does it look like? Um, when we do a vector, we're going to do the same thing. So, dr dt is the limit as delta t goes to zero of delta r, the change in the vector r, divided by delta t. So this is a vector I am dividing by a scalar. Um, and I can write this as, here I'm going to use my sum notation, i equals 1, 2, 3, of the change in ri e hat i divided by delta t. Okay. If we work in Cartesian coordinates, which is where we are going to start, we're going to start with our feet on the flat ground and we're not going to worry about changing coordinate systems. When we start in Cartesian coordinate systems, this guy right here, this is a constant. So when you consider the change in the um, ri ei hat, you don't have to worry about changing unit vectors. It is just delta r i e i hat. Which is to say, if I go back to my comfortable Cartesian coordinate systems, I have system, I have delta x. Uh, here I have dropped the limit. Delta t goes to zero. Lim delta t goes to zero. So in my comfortable Cartesian coordinates, this is the limit as delta t goes to zero of delta x over delta t x hat plus delta y over delta t y hat plus delta z over delta t z hat. That's nice and neat and comfortable. What we're going to do, if you stick with us through the whole year, is that we're going to consider when this isn't true, when the unit vector is also changing. And we're going to touch on it a little bit in this chapter as well. Um, so we're going to come back to the fundamental definition. Remember, I said these definitions are important. It is this is going to come up over and over and over again. Definitions are important put a pin in it, we are going to come back to that because we're going to deal with when the unit vectors change. All right. And let us note here, here we're talking about Cartesian, um, but we're going to take an aside and consider if we do not have Cartesian coordinates, um, then this is going to be the limit as delta t goes to zero of, here this is just a chain rule. You remember your chain rule? You're going to have, you're going to make friends with all of your old calculus. So this is the limit as delta t goes to zero of delta r i over delta t e i hat plus r i delta e i hat delta t um, and that has huge implications it's going to make a big mess when we talk about rotating coordinate systems and spherical polar coordinates because all of those change um, but for now we will we will master Cartesian first. So we're going to just pretend that this thing never happened. And we're going to pretend that we work in Cartesian coordinates for now. All right. So this is then we call this 
dr dt. Now, if we have, we want the derivative of, with respect to time, and it is always important to know what you're taking the derivative with respect to, so d dt of r plus s. Now, I'm going to do an aside. We physicists, we think of this thing as something, and so do mathematicians. This is called an operator. So I take the deriv this thing, as it moves through things, it takes the derivative. Uh, and so I have, I'm going to move my derivative through here. Um, I'm going to note this is an operator because you can think of it like its own separate object. So sometimes we will even write d, dt, and we will put, we might even later when we get to talking about gradients, um, and we're, and um, the del operator, we're going to put vectors around them and we're going to treat this as a thing where it's not actually acting on anything all the time. Um, so we treat the operator on its own. We're not there yet. So the derivative of r plus s, you can just treat this. So if you go back to what this really is, you're looking at the derivative of rx plus sx, x hat plus ry plus sy, y hat plus rz plus s z z hat and our unit vectors are constant so as this moves through we end up with drx dt plus dsx dt um, times x hat dry dt plus dsy dt times y hat drz dt plus dsz dt times z hat and <clears throat> We can regroup it so that we have the RDT X hat plus the RDT Y hat plus the RDZ Z hat, which gives us D R D T, and the same thing for S. So when we have a derivative, it moves through. It just takes the, the derivative of a sum is just the sum of the derivatives. And we can take our handy dandy little derivative operator, d dt of some constant or some function. Let me call it a function, which could be of time or it could be a constant um, times r. Now here we have a chain rule, d f dt times r plus f dr dt. All right, so then we can do a specific example. And we want d dt of our favorite vector r, the position of something. And we are going to have a special notation for this. This is r dot. When you have a dot over it, that means that it is the time derivative, um, not the spatial derivative, the time derivative. So dr dt equals r dot equals the x dt x hat plus dy dt y hat plus the z dt z hat equals x dot x hat plus y dot y hat plus z dot z hat where here i can put that dot over a scalar as well and i'm taking the time derivative of any of the different components and because so this is another so introduction of another bit of notation and because this is a classical mechanics class, I am often talking about the velocity of things. We are going to denote this as the vector v for the velocity. Um, and uh, a short aside, 
This is classical mechanics. Now, later, if you stick with me through the whole year, we are going to introduce a little bit of relativity, but that is not going to come for many months. So hold your horses. But when we do that, time is not constant. So when we take those time derivatives, we have to, at, first of all, specify which time we are taking the derivative with respect to, because it's not the same in all coordinate systems. Um, but then when we move that time derivative operator through things, it doesn't act the same way. Now, here I'm going to introduce a general principle in physics. I'm giving some hints about where we're going because around, um, <laughs> around the turn of the last century, Classical mechanics fell apart, or we talk about it that way. We now know that classical mechanics is not enough. And I'm going to use some very specific language. It is not that classical mechanics is wrong. It is that classical mechanics is a good approximation in many, many cases. But there are times when classical mechanics is not a good enough approximation of the real world to describe what is happening. So we know that classical mechanics works on, from a very small scale where we, and sometimes even when we're talking about atoms, classical mechanics works until we get below about 10 to the negative 10 meters. That's tiny. Now, some, some inklings it falls apart, apart a little bit earlier. It also works on the, time sc on the scale of light years. So it works over an enormous scale. And it, it falls apart when we deal with very, very small and very, very large things. So what we have to do when we, we build up our classical mechanics theory, when we're testing, because we, when we push out a little bit further into classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, we know that classical mechanics is a really good approximation of the world most of the time. So if we have our theory of relativity, which works when we're going super duper fast, close to the speed of light, if we take that theory and make approximations for what happens when we go slower, we have to get back to classical mechanics or else our theory is wrong. Likewise, when we, um, when we deal with quantum mechanics and we are talking about things that are very, very small or some other subtle cases where quantum mechanics is necessary when we take the limits where things are larger, not quite large enough for quantum mechanics to be applicable, we have to get back to classical mechanics. And that is why it is so important for you, dear physics students, to know classical mechanics super duper well. Because if you haven't mastered classical mechanics, you are going to be unmoored when we hit, to re hit relativity and quantum mechanics. Okay, so for now, we're going to deal with time as a constant because it's a pretty dang good approximation most of the time. All right, we are going to talk about reference frames. And again, this is something that you're going to need a great command of to move into relativity. The choice of reference frames is completely and totally arbitrary. It doesn't matter where I put my origin. I should get the same physics no matter what. It does not matter if I put x in this direction or x in this direction. The laws of physics are the same. The laws of physics cannot be sensitive to the arbitrary choices of a random person in Knoxville this year, right at this moment in time. Physics is true. So I have to have a, a set of physical laws, which is independent of where I draw the origin and independent of which direction the axes are. Now, that does not mean that I should choose any set of axes. Because my guiding axiom, axiom, if the laws of physics, of physics are completely independent of the coordinate system, I go back to my fallback. A good physicist 
is a lazy physicist. You want to choose your coordinate system wisely so that you choose the coordinate system that lets you do the least amount of work. Nature is also lazy. Nature does not like doing work. We'll cover that when we get to energy. Okay, so the choice of frame is arbitrary. Physics is the same everywhere. Aside, that, by the way, is how Einstein, or Einstein, developed the theory of relativity because he said, you know what? Physics has to be the same no matter which coordinate system I'm in. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to talk about the laws, the frames in which Newton's laws hold. And we're going to talk about why they don't hold in other frames. Newton's laws hold in inertial frames. An inertial frame is one which is not accelerating. That means it can be, um, it can be moving, but it has to be moving at a constant speed. So if I am on a train and the train is, move, is already accelerated, and the train has a constant speed, that I can choose the inertial reference frame to be with me at the center of it. I can put myself at the center of the world, and most people do. So if I'm moving at a constant speed, I am, an inertial, I am at the center of an inertial frame. Um, if I'm standing still, so right now I am standing on the earth, I at least think that I am standing still, and I can put myself at the center of an inertial frame of reference, almost inertial. Now, we know the earth is rotating, but for most of the things that I am going to measure, the fact that the earth is, the earth is rotating slowly compared to things I might me the time scale of things that I might measure. There are some effects of the rotating Earth, but I can't detect them unless I do a very sensitive experiment or I throw things very far or very fast, um, or I'm measuring very carefully. Um, all right, so we're going to table all of that really exciting stuff, but right now we're going to work with inertial frames. And we're going to start with um, definitions of mass and force. And that might seem super basic, but remember, the basics and the definitions, those are what's going to keep you anchored when you get into the wild and crazy world of quantum mechanics and, um, and relativity. So we have to master them first. All right. So, and I will also note, it's really easy to slip into colloquial definitions. Now we're all physicists here, or at least dabbling in physics. So we understand that these definitions are very important, but we're also people. And sometimes we talk to people who are not physicists or not physicists yet. And Sometimes I might even slip into colloquial definitions. I ask your forgiveness if I slip into colloquial definitions when I am trying to have a technical discussion. Um, when you're doing physics problems, it's important to go back to that definition. All right, so mass is resistance to movement. And to do this, we have to have some, so how, how hard is it to get something moving? It is easier for me to toss this cloth up and down into the air than for to toss this water bottle up into the air. The water bottle is a little bit heavier. I have to use, I have to work harder to get the water bottle to fly and then to get the cloth to fly. Um, and we have a reference mass. It is a chunk of palladium. Um, and iridium, which is somewhere in Paris. Everything else is defined in reference to that. Um, for the most part, you don't need to worry about that chunk of metal in Paris. Um, but when you get precise definitions, it does matter. All right, and force is how hard it is to get something to move. So if I act with more force, it, gets mo it, is, it moves faster. Um, and force, so mass is a scalar, force is a vector. Um, the standard units, which we are going to use in this class, are SI for System International. Um, and sometimes I like throwing in crazy units. I re remain enamored of the slug, which is an imperial unit, and I basically just think the name is funny. 
Um, I find stones to be completely useless. Sometimes I like making jokes about imperial units. But in this class, we basically stick to SI units or System Internationale. Some, they are defined by um, meters, kilograms, and seconds, or, some, or we say MKS. Chemists tend to use centimeters, um, grams, and se seconds, or CGS. Um, sometimes we flip into CGS a little bit just because they're so closely related. Um, when we do this, the units of acceleration are meters per second squared. The units of force are kilograms meters per second squared. Um, and the notation that I am going to use, so this is the acceleration. Unless I define it otherwise, A with a vector means acceleration. F with a vector symbol means the force. And we are going to use A without the vector as the magnitude of acceleration, F without the vector as the magnitude of the force. Um, be careful when in doubt if you are asked on a, on a problem, whether homework or in, uh, on an exam, if you don't know whether you're being asked for the scalar or the vector, when in doubt, ask, because we tend to be unforgiving if we ask for a vector and our physics majors give us a scalar. All right. Um, then we can reintroduce, because you guys are already familiar with this, Newton's first and second laws. So the first law is that an object at rest tends to remain at rest. And the second law is that the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And in our notation, we're going to write this as m r vector double dot, because it is these, let me make sure that those dots are visible, um, because this is the second derivative with respect to time of the position vector. Now, this is also equal to m v dot mass times the first derivative of the velocity, which is equal to p vector dot. Um, and we are going to, so here, we're going to have a little crash course in differential equations. So part of the problem here <clears throat> is that in a perfect world, before you started learning all of this, you would know calculus and, and calculus 1, 2, and 3, so through to vector calculus, and you would know differential equations, and you would know matrix algebra, and you really can't, in most cases, cover all of that before you start taking physics classes and still complete a physics degree in the United States in four years, which is officially the standard time, although it's not really working that way anymore. But um, you're going to have to learn the math with it. Now, that is actually perhaps historically accurate because a lot of this math was developed so that you could do physics. OK, so we are going to rearrange this. Um, we're going to first, so we're going to rearrange this and say f over m equals r double dot. And I have to make my dots big so that you can see them on the screen. We're going to look specifically in one dimension because a lot of times we can choose to talk about motion only in one dimension. It's not that the other dimension isn't important, but we often are focusing on one dimension. So if you have, say, well, there's a number of cases where you either aim in the direction of all of the forces, where the motion truly is restricted in the direction of the forces, or you, the other forces cancel out, or the other motion is so slow that you can neglect the other forces and solve the problem in one dimension. So we're going to start with one dimension. And we can rewrite, we can write this in just the x direction. We often choose x. We can, coordinates are arbitrary. So we're just, if we have one dimensional motion, we're going to line everything up along the x direction.
Now, for now, we're talking about it as if it is x, but we're going to talk later where you might have one dimension, but it's not actually x. It might be a path, for instance, along a roller, co roller coaster. How far have you gone along? along the path of the roller coaster, or it might be some angle. So the variable is not actually a distance um, in along a Cartesian coordinate system, but you have one variable. All right. We can, this is what we call a differential equation. And we call it a second order linear differential equation. It is called a second order differential equation because we have a second derivative. The highest order derivative we have is a second order derivative. We have taken two derivatives with respect to time right here. Um, and it is linear because we don't have any, say, x double dot cubed. Um, x double dot cubed would be uh, a cubic equation. So it is linear because we don't have any squares or cubes or we're not taking functions of anything. It's nice and neat. We can solve second order linear differential equations in most cases. All right. X double dot is equal to DX dot DT. Now, I can multiply on both sides by this dt and integrate. And I am left with dx dot dt dt, the integral of that from, you will often, so here we have to be careful with limits. Sometimes I am sloppy. Um, and sometimes all of us are sloppy, but I can be very specific and say I'm going to go from t equals zero to t, and when I do that, I usually want to make this, I'm going to do, change the variable name to t prime just to make it clear that I'm distinguishing between what my integration variable and the variable that I am going to. This is going to give me an x dot, I am assuming here, that, uh, that at t equals zero, I get, um, so it will actually give me t x dot of, x dot of t minus x dot of zero. Um, and then here I have f x m dt. So, here, and then here I'm going to integrate likewise from 0 to t. Now, if I do this, I might get two integration constants. I only need one integration constant. Often we choose to put the integration constant in the way that, on the side that makes it physically intuitive. So, for instance, this is otherwise known as v0. I tend to flip back and forth a little bit between calling this v0 and v sub i. Bear with me, apologies for my sloppy notation, except my philosophy is other professors are going to do this to you too, so I am going to just make you suffer with the sloppy notation, sorry. Okay, so then if this is a constant, this is nice and easy. Um, we've actually, you've covered the case when this is constant, even if you don't realize it yet. So I integrate here and I get... If I put in t equals 0, then that term goes to 0. Um, and I get fx over mt. So here, because I want to be explicit about my assumptions, I am assuming this is constant. I have bad handwriting. You learn how to deal, how to read it. I try to be very, okay, I have bad handwriting, but what you'll notice is that I have developed a style of very distinct handwriting, which I at least perceive to be neat when I'm writing equations so that you can follow me. All right, so then I get with this the equation x dot of t, which is equal to dx 
dt equals v0 plus fx over m t, which you might also recognize as the acceleration times time. And this is equal to dx dt. Now, why am I doing you? You probably, if you're here, you could have done this way faster. But the reason why I am being so slow and methodical is because when we start talking about what happens when you add air resistance, these steps are not quite as comfortable or as obvious. Um, so here, I'm going to multiply by dt, and I get dx dt dt, the integral from 0 to t, which is equal to x of t minus x of 0 is equal to v 0 t oh actually let me let me be pedagogical cuz <laughs> i'm teaching right now so i should be pedagogical v 0 plus a t d t from 0 to t and again i'm going to rename t d to t prime just to make it clear just to distinguish between my integration variable and my um, my answer so now I get v0 t plus 1 half a t squared. And because this limit here is a 0, that term goes to 0. So I am left with x of t equals x of 0 plus v0 t plus 1 half a squared. All right. That was probably almost painfully slow for most of you. All right. I am going to, though, we take this. This will be one of your familiar equations. The velocity equals the initial velocity plus the acceleration times time. The position equals the initial position plus the velocity, initial velocity times time plus one half times the acceleration times time squared. And then you can rearrange these two. They're actually, um, it, you get the same, uh, it's not an independent equation, but you can rearrange it to get um, v final squared equals v initial squared plus 2a times delta x, which I am going to write as x minus x zero. Um, and this, I consider your toolkit when you are solving um, kinematic equations. Um, and I just want to highlight what matters here is the definition of acceleration. So when you put, if you're talking about projectile motion and you put y to be pointing in the down direction, the acceleration is negative g. All right, that surely looks almost, that's sh surely familiar and almost painfully slow. All right, so then it is important to note that Newton's first law, that an object at rest remains at rest, only works in an inertial reference frame. So remember, an inertial reference frame is one which is either not moving or is moving at a constant velocity. So if you have a frame of reference which is accelerating, it is not an inertial reference frame. So if I am on a train and I am throwing a marker up and down and you are at the station and you are watching me throw the marker up and down, um, if, well actually you can't really move at constant velocity in the station. So you're, you're standing out in a field watching the train um, if from my perspective, my frame with me at the center of the world, that frame is an inertial reference frame and your frame with you at the center of the world, that is also an inertial reference frame. So if I look in my frame, what I see is 
I see the marker just flying up and down. And that is um, free fall. I would probably draw the y-axis up and down like this and the x-axis in this direction. And because I am in, at rest in my own reference frame, I see the marker going up and down in the y direction. You, watching from, the, from a field, would see that the marker has a constant velocity and the marker goes like this, um, but it's, so you see a parabola where it is moving with a constant velox velocity in the x direction and it is flying up and down in the y direction. Um, so um, each of us has an inertial reference frame that will follow Newton's laws in both cases, although we would describe the motion differently. Um, in either case, in that reference frame, the laws of motion are followed. An example of a non-inertial reference frame is that you're driving in a car and suddenly the car slams on the brakes. When, when the car slams on the brakes, you feel like you're thrown ahead. Um, What's actually happening is that the car is stopping. So in the car's reference frame, you're thrown ahead by some invisible force. But a bystander watching you sees that you are trying, your body is trying to go straight until you hopefully um, are stopped by the seatbelt, because you should always wear your seatbelt. Um, but you, you, the, the observer sees the seatbelt stop you. Now, when that car slams on its brakes, it is not an inertial reference frame because it is accelerating. Um, another example is that the car, you're in a car, and all of a sudden the car turns, you will, if, you will feel like you're getting thrown out to the side. But what's actually happening is that the car is moving out from under you. And it's only when the seatbelt, because you should always wear your seatbelt, catches you that the seatbelt exerts a force to keep you moving with the car. Um, and then um, you can also, so if you actually try to see if Newton laws, Newton's laws work, they will not work in an accelerating reference frame because it will lead to apparent forces. And that comes into account, for instance, when we talk about the Earth. The Earth is very large con compared to a lot of the motion that we're talking about. When you drive to work or school, the Earth is much larger than the distance that you travel to go to school. So you, for the most part, don't have to worry about the fact that the Earth is not flat. Um, but you do get, because the Earth is rotating and you are rotating with the Earth, um, you do get effects like the Coriolis effect, which are an apparent force. They are not a real force, but they are an apparent force. Um, and you can also, um, so you can get these apparent forces. Um, and when we need, when we get to relativity, we'll need to modify the forms of Newton's laws to come up with versions of them that hold. But, um, but you find that Newton's law, there are ver versions of Newton's laws that still hold with relativity, but it won't hold when you're dealing with an accelerating uh, coordinate system. Then we get to Newton's third law, and let me do an aside. I don't care if you memorize this. What I care is that you internalize it, that you understand whether or not you can define exactly which is which law, that you know what is actually, you know what is followed. Newton's third law is <coughs> every object um, uh, exerts an equal and opposite force on the objects that exert a force on it. So we're going to define this using subscripts. We have F, 1, 2, e, the, uh, the force of object 1 on object 2 is equal to the negative of the force of object 2 on object 1. So this is Newton's third law in vector notation. So it's equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. And that's why vectors are so useful, because this is a lot easier to write down than all of the mess in words. Um, and there is a very specific e example that we're going to cover a lot in this class, and that is central forces. So central forces are a force where the, the force is along the line between two objects. And you know two of them. 
that are near and dear to you, there is gravity and the electrostatic force. So if you have object one and object two, a central force is the object is the is some force that acts along the line between the two objects. Um, and the fact that it has to be along the, li the line means that it's really easy to figure out the directions. It's really easy to construct something that makes that act um, that way. So we can consider two objects interacting. Um, and so force, uh, this is object one, and there's the force, uh, ah, let's see. I think I'd said it the opposite way. I'm, the force on object one from object two, we'll write as F12. And then there may be some external forces which do not come from um, object two. And then I'm gonna draw the forces on object two. This one has to be equal and opposite. In equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. And so this is F21. I have made a mess of that part of the board. So F21. And there can be some external forces. And there is n on, on two. And there's nothing saying there's no relationship between the external forces on those two objects. OK. So then, when we consider the momentum, I'm going to write the momentum of object one. Here's where, when I write lowercase, um, I don't indicate anything funny. When I get to the uppercase, I'm going to draw some lines on it to distinguish it from my lowercase. All right, so uh, Newton's so if we draw the change in momentum, this is equal to the force of one, the change in momentum on object one is equal to um, the force of on object one from object two plus whatever external forces there are on object one. And then we're going to draw we're going to write something exactly the same but change the subscripts for object two. And then, because these two are equal, and op equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, so I'm going to just write in some corrections there. I'm going to replace this by F12. I can add up the total momentum, and I'm going to denote the total momentum with a capital P. My capital P looks kind of funny, but I want to make sure that you can distinguish my capital P from my lowercase p. Uh, and uh, these should have been P dots, so this is capital P dot. The change in the total momentum of the system is equal to the sum of external forces on object one and external forces on object two. Um, <clears throat> so these two have canceled out. So the change in momentum is equal to the sum of the change in ex is equal to the sum of external forces. So I can write this as capital P dot is we're actually going to write capital F external. All right, so then if you have no external forces, then you have conservation of momentum in the system. Um, and that is incredibly useful. You guys have surely already done some problems that involve momentum conservation. This is shown here for two particles, but it extends to n particles. You can, it doesn't matter how many, um, how many forces you have. So let me just expand my notation. So we are going to have, in general, 
the P, the momentum, or let's start with the momentum of one particle, P sub I, is equal to the sum of forces from other objects plus external forces, meaning not from the system that you're talking about. So then the total momentum is equal to the sum of the momenta of each of the given particles and the de time derivative of the total momentum is equal to the sum of the time derivatives of the individual particles. This should have a dot. Um, I need to make my dots large enough to see. And this is equal to a double sum so here, my index is alpha. Here, I'm going to have alpha and beta, but I don't add, so I don't have an alpha equals beta term. So the forces, this is how I denote the forces between the different particles or objects. And then plus the external forces. All right, and then here I'm adding up all of the forces, but for every alpha um, not equal to beta, there is always an F alpha beta, which is equal to the negative of F beta alpha. So no matter how many particles you have, the sum of the internal forces has to equal zero Internal forces cannot change the total momentum. So you get conservation of momentum. The total momentum in the system is equal to the sum of external forces on its components. And at this point, it's worth making a few notes that this, um, this third law that the, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction, or each object, the, the force of one thing on another is the equal to the negative of the force of that thing on the original object. So that holds when you're in an inertial reference system. Um, relativity requires the, so when you have, the, have time changing, so you have to, decide when, at what time you are measuring these forces. And if each object has its own set of coordinate systems, that doesn't even really make sense. So this becomes problematic when we hit relativity. Hint, the way we solve it is by defining something called proper time, and this holds in when you're measuring with respect to proper time. Um, but we aren't there yet. And it's also worth noting here, if you don't consider relativity, the magnetic force violates the third law because a changing, a moving charge leads to a changing magnetic field. So if you have a changing magnetic field, yeah, you, it, it, if, whether or not that charge is moving depends on your coordinate system. So your forces cannot be independent of coordinate system. Um, this is still approximately valid when you have a charge which is moving much, much less than the speed of light. Okay, so now we're going to zoom in on specifically how to apply this in Cartesian coordinates, how to apply the second law in Cartesian coordinates. We are going to start with our vector equation even when we get sloppy and we start writing things as scalars and we focus on one dimension, we should always make sure as we're working that this is actually valid and that we know what we're doing. Okay, this corresponds to fx x hat plus f y y hat plus f z z hat equals 
m x double dot x hat plus m y double dot y hat plus m z double dot z hat. All right. Now, when I have a vector equation, because x hat is constant and uh, here it's a vector, everything, each of the components has to equal each other on each side. So I can factorize this into three different equations. fx equals mx double dot. Let me make sure my dots are big and visible. fy equals my double dot. fz equals m z double dot. All right. This is three different equations. I can consider the motion in each direction separately. Now, you guys saw this in introductory physics, but maybe it didn't quite really click. This is just because of the way that vector math works. And a good part of the reason this factorizes and I don't have to worry about mixing here and here is because my unit vectors in Cartesian coordinates are constant. It makes life a lot easier. Now, if I had unit vectors that changed equally on both sides, I could also pull that off. Uh, but because these values are constant, I can just say, well, everything here, everything multiplied by x hat has to be true, has to be equal on both sides of the equation. All right, now we are going to do a problem near and dear to my heart, which you have surely seen. A block sliding down an inclined plane. Now why? I'm sure that you have seen this problem, but I still think that it is really important. And I like to put it on all of my upper division classical mechanics tests because this is so important. I don't think you should graduate with a physics degree until you can do this in your sleep. This is one of our first examples where your choice of coordinate system determines how hard you have to work. Um, all right, we are going to, here's our incline plane. Do, 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 do. By the way, you can draw better if you make noises. I can draw better if I make noises. All right, we're going to have our block. So here is our coordinate system. Most of the time, you probably want to put x in this direction and y in this direction, but don't do it. It's not your friend. All right. We have a block here. It has mass m. The forces on it, we do our free body diagram, which because you are upper division physics students, you surely must know how to do backwards and forwards. We have weight, the normal force, the normal force, so the weight acts as if it's acting in the center of mass. That will become important when we consider something rolling down. Um, the normal force actually acts at the point of contact. contact. For this problem, we're considering everything, we, we're considering it acting as if it's acting the same as a point particle. And then friction acts, again, at the point of contact. So friction is there. So these are our three forces. Friction, well, I've drawn friction going this way. We're talking here about a block sliding down an inclined plane, but friction always counteracts motion. So if the block is sliding up the inclined plane, friction is in one direction. If the block is sliding down the inclined plane, friction is acting in the opposite direction. You guys are, drum roll please, upper division physics students. So if I ask you a problem and I ask you to calculate how long it takes for that block to travel up the inclined plane and back down the inclined plane, I want you to make sure that you know that friction acts up when the block is sliding down and acts down when the block is sliding up. However, friction will also never cause the block to accelerate. Friction only keeps things from moving. It doesn't make them move faster. All right, now the trick to this problem 
as I am sure you guys know, is to not use this coordinate system, but to use a coordinate system lined up with the plane where this is x and this is y. And the reason why this um, works so well is because the net force in the y direction has to be zero. The normal force never causes things to fly off surfaces. <clears throat> Actually, I should say, it's not that friction doesn't cause things to accelerate. Friction always acts to slow two surfaces in contact down. The normal force always, uh, always uh, will never cause two surfaces to move apart. It keeps them from getting squished together. All right. Now I am going to be pedantic again because I'm teaching and that's what being pedantic means. So the normal force is equal to the magnitude of the normal force in the y hat direction. The weight is equal to negative w cosine theta x hat um, plus w sine theta y hat. Now, sines and cosines, don't memorize what is what, because I can always give you a problem where I put theta there instead. I do tend not to write gotcha questions on exams, but um, not on purpose, at least. Um, but you can't memorize how you break some, a vector into its components. You have to look at the situation and reason it out. So here, um, you can look at similar triangles. This here is a right triangle. Um, and then you can uh, figure out that that angle there is also theta. Um, or you can say, well, I know it's got to be sine or cosine. If my angle is zero, I have to get uh, an... That's why... <laughs> Oops. If my angle is zero, it has to be all in the y direction. So there, you can see that I switched my x and my y. It's in my notes correctly, and I wrote it down incorrectly when I was writing it up on the board. Okay, so when my theta is zero, all of the weight has to be in the y direction. Um, when my, uh, and then my weight is going to act in the positive x direction, the way I've written x. By the way, you could write x going positive up the plane, and you don't have to put the origin at the top of the plane. It doesn't matter. I happen to write it this way this time. Sometimes when I'm doing the problem, I write it completely differently. I'm a physicist. I tend to like doing things differently just to do them differently if I get an arbitrary choice. All right, so then my force of friction. Now here, you're, technically, you have an inequality. The force of friction is less than, or the magnitude of the force of friction is less than or equal to the, um, well, we're talking about moving, so it's less than or equal to the kinetic force of friction times the magnitude of the normal force. Now, if you had something you were asking if the block can slide down the inclined plane, you would have the static um, coefficient of friction, which is always slightly larger than the kinetic force of friction. Once you are moving, it is easier to keep moving. So the force of kinetic friction is slightly smaller than the force of static friction. All right, so this is the technically an inequality, but when we solve this problem, we're always talking about it moving. Therefore, the force of friction is always um, going to be slowing things down. See, this is where the force of friction doesn't cause things to accelerate, uh, relative, uh, doesn't cause two surfaces to accelerate rel relative to each other. Um, but we're always working, in this case, in the situation where friction is at its maximum. I'm going to put parentheses around this because we're going to kind of ignore that when we add up everything. So friction, then, is negative mu sub k times the normal force in the x hat direction because it is acting opposite to the direction of motion. Now, we can then add things up. I'm going to break it into components. The y component is equal to the normal force minus, um, minus w cosine theta, where w is mass times the gravitational constant. 
and this has to equal zero. So the normal force is equal to W cosine theta. The force in the x direction is then W sine theta minus mu sub k, and now we're going to put in W cosine theta. So there's a number of questions that I can ask about this particular problem, asking you to get the acceleration correct, um, whether or not the, the block is sliding up or down the inclined plane. Um, and then uh, static versus kinetic friction. You should know that static friction, that friction never causes two surfaces to accelerate relative to each other. All right, we typically write this as MA along the x direction is equal to MG sine theta minus mu sub k MG cosine theta or A equals G sine theta minus mu sub k cosine theta. And this is for going down the hill. I could be, I can consider up the hill here. I'm going to change color and write or up the plane. Um, the box is sliding up the plane. Then this is positive. And here, this is positive. And here, this is positive. And that is positive. So um, if I am sliding up the hill, my um, force of friction slows, uh, um, my force of friction decreases the magnitude of the force. If I'm going, sorry, if I'm up the hill, if I'm sliding, yeah, if I'm sliding up the hill, friction slows down the acceleration. If I'm going down the hill, it increases the acceleration because the block is only slowing down. All right, and then you could choose way, how you do this. This is x double dot square, or it's x double dot. So you can integrate it twice, and you can use our standard, or you can use our standard kinematic equations. x dot equals v naught plus g sine theta. Um, and... Let me just stick to, I have to treat my signs carefully because I happen to do the exact opposite in my notes of what I wrote on the board. So here, plus or minus g mu k cos theta, that is the curse of never doing things exactly the same. And then if we have um, here, this is then 1 half g sine theta plus or minus cosine theta t squared. All right, so just keep in, in mind, you can never let the uh, let friction give you a negative acceleration. This term can never be bigger than that term. Um, and that's really, you have to use your brain. You cannot take these equations and find, find, plug them in and use them blindly. You have to think. Um, and you guys have seen this before, but now that you're super comfortable with calculus, this is a lot easier. And I also want to point out the reason why this particular frame works is because there's a constraint. The constraint is that the, that the force in the y direction has to be zero because the normal force cannot cause this thing to accelerate up or down. You could work that out. You could write the constraint um, that the normal force has to cancel out the weight 
in Cartesian coordinates lined up this way. At one point, I tried to do it as a pedagogical exercise for a class, and it got really, really ugly really fast, and I gave up because I decided that it was not worth it. And the point of this exercise is also so that you keep in mind that you shouldn't just use these as the default coordinates and assume that that's always the right thing to do. You should be thinking about which set of coordinates is going to lead to less work for you because a good physicist is a lazy physicist. All right, so we are now going to talk about two-dimensional polar coordinates. Um, and this is the set of coordinates that we're going to use when we have a problem that has some type of rotational um, symmetry, or it may be that we're talking about motion in a circle and we're going to conveniently choose to describe our, to put our origin at the center of that circular motion, um, or there's some radial symmetry where it makes it a lot easier. This is going to be a set of coordinate systems where those unit vectors are no longer constant um, when we change variables. So we're going to start with our Cartesian coordinate systems, which we're nice and comfortable with. So this is the x and the y coordinates. Instead of describing this, this point in terms of x and y, we are going to describe it in terms of r and theta, where r is the distance from the origin to the point we will keep our position vector called r vector. Um, and now we have theta. Um, and theta is the angle between the x-axis and the y-axis. Now, I am using the board in this mode where you're seeing the mirror image of what I see. So you're actually going to see the mirror image of what you would see in the book. That tends to be OK here. Just be aware if it looks a little bit different, it's because you're seeing the mirror image. I'm not going to do cross products, so it's not really going to be a problem right now. All right, so we're going to use r and theta. And then we have to define our um, unit vectors. The first one is easy. The first one is r hat. And r hat is in the direction of r. So r hat is going to actually depend on the position that you are in. Um, on, in the xy plane. So if I am talking about a point here, r hat is here instead of there. If I move down here, r hat is there. r hat points from the origin to the point. So r hat now changes depending on where I move in the plane. Um, on the other hand, it's really easy to tell me what r is. Um, I can always describe the vector r as r, r hat. It's nice and neat, but all of the change is here um, if I'm moving in a circle. All right, my next vector, um, ah, and actually I'm not going to call this theta, I'm going to call it phi um, to match the notation in the book. Now, we have a choice. We always, well, we have multiple choices. You guys are either, either have never had uh, linear algebra or matrix algebra, or you're concurrently taking it in most cases. So we sort of fudge past some of the concepts. When we have unit vectors, we want our unit vectors to be what we call a complete set, which means that we want the unit vectors to describe all possible variables. Um, and so I can, dis I can have unit vectors as long as I can def define everything um, with my unit vectors, it doesn't matter what I choose. So I could choose r hat and phi hat like this, and those would be a complete set because no matter what, I can describe all variables, all, everything in the xy plane with those two unit vectors. I could also, uh, well, I, I can have two unit vectors if this is r hat and this is phi hat, that is not going to work because I cannot define all vectors in terms of these unit vectors. So this is not a complete set. Um, we choose in physics, in almost all cases, to work with orthogonal unit vectors, which means that we want them to be perpendicular. So if I choose r hat to be like that, I want to choose phi hat to either be like this or like that. 
I have an arbitrary choice. Um, it's an arbitrary choice. The laws of physics should be the same either way. But by can, but remember, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. Not all arbitrary choices are equally valuable. The same way that when we were doing the, um, the problem of the block sliding down the inclined plane, our choice of coordinates is completely and totally arbitrary. But if you choose the choice of coordinates well, then you end up with less work. So our goal here is to do less work. A good physicist is a lazy physicist. So by convention, because this happens to work out well, um, we choose, we want to choose orthogonal unit vectors. Um, so we want them to be perpendicular and um, we need them to be a complete set. And then you have a choice of whether you want phi hat to be this in this direction or in that direction. By convention, we choose the unit vector to be in the direction of increasing variable. So when phi increases, it's going this way. So phi hat is going to point in this direction. Those are two arbitrary but well-motivated choices. Um, and you will find that basically all physics books that use um, two-dimensional polar coordinates are going to make those choices. If you're going to choose anything else, you should have a good reason for it. Now, when we change variables, you've probably seen these variables in your vector calculus class, but you didn't, they were more abstract and you didn't, you're going to exercise your different coordinate muscles in this class. It, because the choice, a good choice of coordinates significantly decreases the amount of work that you have to do. So now we're going to use x equals r cosine theta. So this is how we transform the variables. y equals r sine theta. You guys are now upper division physics majors, so I expect you to be able to look at this picture and figure that out really quickly. Um, we can rearrange this and see that r squared equals x squared plus y squared and tangent of phi equals y over x. So we can go from any from x and y to phi or vice versa. Be careful here because you have um, because you've defined the angle up to a sine um, and you want to make sure that you are actually getting the correct angle. Okay. Um, and we can also choose now r hat is our vector divided by the magnitude of our vector. So it is x, x hat plus y, y hat over x squared plus y squared, the square root of all that. Now, this comes in handy, for instance, if you want to look at the change in r hat um, when we talk about doing derivatives. Um, all right, so now we can denote any vector, um, any vector a, as some number r hat plus some other number phi hat. All vectors can be described as some sum of components in r hat and phi hat directions. Um, and if you're wanting to think of an application of this, think about the torque. When we apply a torque to a given point, um, you have r cross f. Um, so if I put the torque, the force here, now I'm using my left hand because I've not mirrored the image, so R cross F, and then uh, you find that the torque is pointing towards you. Um, and the so at this point, to have a non-zero torque, you're only looking at the phi hat component of the force. Okay, so now our unit vectors are not, in fact, um, constant. So neither dr hat dt, the r hat dt is not equal to zero, and the phi hat dt is not equal to zero. We have to be a little bit more careful. So now, um, if we think about, let's imagine r is rotating. Uh, well, so we, we're changing position here. So, a slight change in r hat 
you don't have r hat moving in the r hat direction because if r if your position is going out like this r hat is still in the same direction so the only thing that can change r hat is if your angle phi is changing so a small change in r hat is roughly proportional to a small change in phi times phi hat. However phi hat is changing, that's uh, in, in here, the, if the change in phi hat is positive, then r hat is changing in the positive phi hat direction. Okay, so then we can write delta r hat delta phi uh, ah, actually, I want to make a slight, here I'm going to um, write that this is roughly d phi hat dt times a small change in t. So here I have replaced this by this. So I have some amount that phi is changing in time, some time derivative of phi, and my change in, del in a given time interval delta t, my change in delta phi is d phi dt times delta t. So then I have delta r hat delta t is roughly equal to d phi dt phi hat. And as they take the limit of dt goes to zero, I can get dr hat dt is equal to d phi hat dt phi hat. So here, um, and this is, I can also write phi dot phi hat. So here, I have figured out my change in phi hat, uh, my, change, my time derivative of r hat. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing for phi hat. Um, by the way, if you're in my class, the first semester, we're not really going to stress this. The second semester, we are going to use it a lot. Um, delta phi hat is approximately equal to negative delta phi r hat. So here, um, how much does phi hat change? Um, so phi hat, if it changes, it has to move in the r hat direction. Um, and the only thing, so here, the only thing that's going to change phi hat, again, if r is increasing or decreasing, but it's staying in the same direction, neither of the unit vectors change. But if I increase, um, let's try to sketch this a little bit. I am going to increase, uh, that orange is the color I already have, pink. Okay, uh, yeah, that's slightly different. Um, so I'm going to make a very close R, and now my new r hat is going to be like that, and or my new phi hat is like that, and let me actually exaggerate this so that you can see it a little bit more. I'm going to draw the r hat, uh, r vector there so I can, so we're going to draw a bigger change simply to make it more visible. Now, my phi hat is here, and so I have a tiny bit of change. My change in phi hat is in this direction. So that is in the negative r hat direction. And it's going to change when delta phi changes. So I can come back over here. Delta phi is approximately equal to the change in phi times r hat. And we can do the same trick here. 
this is negative d phi dt. Uh, delta t r hat, so delta phi hat, delta t is roughly equal to negative d phi dt r hat, and this is negative phi dot r hat. Um, you actually could do this by taking the unit vectors. Um, so here you have r hat. You can actually write that uh, you could take, let me double check that I get the directions right. You can write by hat, and then it's going to be in the negative you're going to have the negative x hat direction and the positive y hat direction, same division to get it to be a unit vector. So here you have r hat and phi hat. And if you wanted to do this, if you are not convinced by my argument here, you can take the derivatives using this. You can say d r hat d t equals d uh, r hat d x d x d t plus d r hat d y d y dt, and the same expression for phi hat. And you would get these expressions right here. Um, you would have to take the derivative of this expression, and then you would want to convert your variables back into, um, back into x, or back into phi and theta, and then you would get these expressions. It would be a lot of ugly algebra, but it would get you to, um, to the, the same answer that we just derived. All right, so now we are going to just write a quick summary so we have it readily available. Uh, and, you know, honestly, I'm writing this because I don't have these things mem memorized. And as a general rule, if I don't have it memorized, you don't need to have it memorized. So dr hat dt equals phi dot theta hat d phi hat dt equals negative phi dot r hat. Okay. What is more important to memorize is the, um, the way that you would go about doing this again. Physicists tend not to be people who memorize things. In fact, it's kind of funny when you watch different groups of students because if you're teaching pre-meds, they will try to memorize as many, you know, they'll try to memorize everything. And in physics, that often doesn't quite work because you have to understand when the equation applies, so you can't simply memorize a bunch of equations. Physicists will do, spend half a page, would rather write half a page of algebra to rederive an equation rather than memorize a very simple equation. It's a funny thing about how we self-sort. All right, so now we can write r equals r r hat. So in polar coordinates, this is a very compact notation. And then we want to take a derivative because we're often talking about figuring out the velocity. We want the velocity and the acceleration of everything. So now dr vector dt equals, we're going to just apply the chain rule to this right here, dr dt, actually let me, let me write this out a little bit more explicitly. So 
Think of this thing as an operator. It moves through and it acts on um, what it sees. And so instead of writing this as just r vector, we're going to write r vector is r r hat. So we have a product of two things. We have a derivative acting on a product of two things. So we can apply our chain rule. This is dr dt, where I have put the parentheses around it to make it clear it is only the time derivative of r with respect to t. r hat plus r d five, uh, sorry, r d r hat dt. And this is equal, here I'm going to drop the parentheses, so unless stuff is explicitly acted on by the derivative, I write that. Now I'm going to replace the r hat dt with phi dot phi hat. So the, if we go back to our um, coordinate system, we have x, y, r, and then we have r hat and phi hat. So, our change in, so our velocity, the change in r is a function of time. If we only have r changing, then the only component of the velocity is in the r hat direction. If we have r changing and phi changing, well, let's do, if you only have phi changing, then your r is, um, is always getting, your dr dt has r phi dot, theta hat, so this is just adding, so this is the arc length, as a, the change in arc length is a fun, function of time when you're rotating, and then you can get both at the same time. You can also rewrite this as, um, uh, we can, we can um, call this component the velocity in the r direction, uh, let me not, I just mean the scalar, this is the velocity in the r direction, and this is the velocity in the theta direction, or in the phi direction. I keep wanting to call it theta. Um, so, we can rewrite this as um, r dot r hat plus r phi dot phi hat and this is also r omega where omega is the angular velocity um, times phi hat. Now we want to take to look at the acceleration so this is r vector dot we want to get r vector double dot. So this is the time derivative acting on the time derivative of r. So this is d dt of r dot r hat plus r phi dot phi hat. Okay, so I'm going to pause right now because this is an ugly mess. What do I expect you to do? Um, I am not going to ask my students to uh, rederive this. Honestly, if I have to do this, I am going to look it up in a book rather than rederive it every time. Um, what I want you to do is know that it's different. Know that when you're working in polar coordinates, you have to be careful about coordinate systems because you can no longer, you don't take derivatives as simply anymore because your, uh, your unit vectors are not constant. This is an ugly expression. 
It's just another product roll. I'm actually going to switch colors so that you can see it over my face. All right, so we're going to apply our chain rule here. Um, actually, I'm just going to work through this. I'm not going to rewrite the derivative. Um, this is our double dot r hat plus the r hat dt, which is, well, first I just carry over the r dot. So it's r dot, the r hat dt, which is phi dot phi hat plus, here I have r dot phi dot phi hat, that's the derivative of the first term, plus r phi double dot phi hat plus r phi dot the phi hat dt, here I've gotten messy, um, so phi dot times negative phi dot r hat. Okay, now I can combine my terms that have phi hat. That's these three terms. I can combine my terms that have r hat. That's these two terms. So r double dot equals r vector double dot equals r scalar double dot minus r omega dot squared r hat. Now here, if I look at my terms, these two terms are the same. So I have a plus 2 r dot phi dot plus r phi double dot phi hat. All right, I would recommend you, uh, you check units. Um, so always check units because as you get uglier and uglier equations, it's easier and easier to make a stupid math mistake. And um, when you get, so what you've had in classes before, um, when you made stupid math mistakes, you only had a couple, you could in principle do the problem in a couple lines of algebra. So recovering from a stupid math mistake was not that hard. You would just redo the algebra, double check yourself, whatever, it's not that bad. Upper division classical mechanics is the first class that most physics majors take where you might spend a page or sometimes even two doing a lot of ugly algebra to solve a problem. So it behooves you to check your work as you go along. So here we're going to check units. This has units of distance divided by time squared. So every term in, on this side should have units of distance divided by time squared. Distance divided by time squared, that's easy. This has distance. This phi dot has units of 1 over time. So phi dot squared has units of 1 over time squared. So this has units of distance divided by time squared. Unit vectors are unitless. Here you have distance divided by time divided by time correct units. Distance divided by time squared. Good. We're good. Now, you can get an incorrect expression with the correct units, but most of the time when you make dumb algebra mistakes, you are also going to make, um, you're going to make really big mistakes more often than small mistakes, and then your units are just going to be, um, are just going to be completely and totally wrong. Um, the other thing that you should, so you have two time derivatives per term, so there should always be a the two um, times in the two dots somewhere. So two dots, two dots, two dots, two dots. That's just making sure that everything works out right. Um, and I want to add a nota bene uh, or note well. Uh, this is the 
part when I was taking undergraduate classical mechanics that me and everybody else in my class just completely flipped out like, what have we gotten ourselves into? This is ugly, this is confusing, this is a lot of, of crazy algebra. I have, you know, so part of you goes, whoa, I'm so excited to do this. And part of you goes, oh my God, I'm so confused. And that's okay. Um, what I want you to think when you see this page of ugly algebra, you got this. Each little step, I hope you understood. Each little step is tiny. The way that you do well in upper division classical mechanics is to take tiny steps and check your work each time. And that's a really important skill to develop as a physicist because once you get out of coursework, you're working without a net. You don't, you're often solving problems that have never been solved before, so you don't, no one can, you, you can't look in the back of the book to check your answer. So you have to develop skills for checking your own work as you go along. And this is why we highlight all the time checking your units and checking orders of magnitude. You also, in the course of this class and your other physics classes, are going to develop how you estimate orders of magnitude so that you can tell if you're really, really off or if you are pretty close. So if you can do an order of magnitude estimate, you can often at least make sure that, uh, so it, you take something like, you might be doing something with relativity, and relativity matters, but you're going to go back to classical mechanics because in general it's easier and the expressions are simpler. And you're going to see if you got some roughly the same order of magnitude answer when you consider classical mechanics because the relativistic corrections are probably small. Same thing for quantum mechanics. You can often use your classical mechanics to double check your work when you get to harder, more complicated problems where our physical intuition fails us more. Now, you're already running into things where your physical int intuition is wrong, but it's going to be more wrong when we hit classical mechanics and relativity. And that is part of why classical mechanics is so important, and it's so important for you to nail this. Um, but what I want, what I don't want you to look at and go, I don't want you to look at this and go, what am I in for? Well, maybe you can think that, but instead go, I know how to do every little step. As long as I work in little steps, I'm okay. I can always move forward. All right. So we can rewrite this. And it may start to look a little bit familiar from rotational motion um, as you um, addressed it as an undergrad. Um, so here in your R hat terms, uh, so you have r double dot minus r omega squared, because phi dot is just the angular velocity, plus 2 r dot omega plus r alpha phi dot. So when you have rotation, this is your angular acceleration, this is angular speed, um, and this is how long, how quickly your uh, velocity is changing. Now, we can take a special case where r is a constant, and um, so this is rotational motion where about a fixed radius, with a fixed radius. So then, this term is zero, and you have negative r omega squared r hat. Uh, and then this term is 0 plus r alpha phi hat. So this is our um, v squared over r term. And it is pointed in the negative r hat direction. This is just saying if you are moving at a constant angular velocity, your angular acceleration is v squared over r in the negative r hat direction, so pointing towards the center. And then this is if you are speeding up or slowing down, that is also changing your r double dot. So that should look very familiar. Um, 
I would also like to point out here, and I'm going to try to highlight this in the, the notes on YouTube, there's my series of introductory physics lectures where you can go back and review this at an introductory level. Uh, okay, so then we can talk about what each of these terms are. Um, and R double dot R hat is the radial acceleration. And we have negative r phi dot squared. r hat is from rotation at constant speed, constant angular speed. And r phi dot squared, or not r phi double dot. Phi hat is from angular acceleration, and this term is the Coriolis acceleration. And this is discussed in more, at more in chapter 9, where we'll also consider spherical polar coordinates, and it gets even uglier because we're also considering you're rotating in three dimensions. Um, but this is this extra term. This is an apparent force because you're working in uh, non-Cartesian coordinates. Um, and we can take this and we can rewrite Newton's second law in polar coordinates. I'm actually going to write it over here because we're going to use it in an example we can write that the force is equal to m r double dot oh, let me switch back to my nice bright green because it's much more visible than the blue the force is equal to m r double dot minus r phi dot squared r hat plus m r phi double dot plus 2 r dot phi dot phi hat. Um, and I'm going to clean up these equations around it because we're not going to need it for the example problems. Um, so all we've done here we're calling it writing uh, Newton's second law in polar coordinates. We've really just taken Newton's second law and written it so that we don't have to handle the derivatives carefully every single time because it's messy. Um, and I just want to highlight what we're doing in my class, which is how I'm going to record these lectures, is that we're going to skip the section on Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics in the first semester and only come back to it in the second semester. Um, and when we do that, um, so we're, there's a few parts in the textbook where it gets a little hairy to, because the textbook explains things depending on de using Lagrangian mechanics. Um, I'll go through it in the uglier, but um, more straightforward way. Um, and I might, I will also do some problems where I do it in the, using Lagrangian mechanics too, just in case you're curious. Um, but I want to point out, so this ugliness, working in polar coordinates, working in spherical polar coordinates, the math gets really ugly when you learn Lagrangian mechanics it tends to simplify the math a lot because you're no longer having to think about Newton's second law and how do I write Newton's second law using polar coordinates. You really just write things in terms of their natural variables and take derivatives and then the, the most convenient coordinates fall out of it. So I want to put a pin in that and say that this motivates what we're going to be doing a little bit, well, next semester, 
Um, but uh, we're going to fudge past it. So ugly equations. Remember, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. So we're going to try to not work any harder than we have to. All right. We're going to do, um, the last thing that we're going to do in this chapter is an example. Um, this is example 1.2, um, and it is an oscillating skateboard. So we're going to choose our coordinate system. Um, if you watched my introductory videos, you say that I have, you would see that I have a preferred approach to problem solving. Um, what's going to help you because now you're in, now you're playing with the big dogs. Um, so some of these equations get, some of these problems get rather ugly. I would still very much recommend that you follow some system. The system that I recommend is virtually always, one, draw a picture, and then two, write down what you know. Um, so that's going to mean first defining, you know, defining things in the problem. So as you're doing, reading the problem, it's going to give you hints as to what different variables are and, uh, and what the right approach might be. And you just start writing down all the stuff that you know. And then you see if there's anything that you can go to, that you can work with on that. So, the, so step three is then start solving. So we're going to draw a picture. We have a skateboard, which is in a half pipe. And I am not the world's greatest artist. Uh, this has a radius R. So we're going to draw this. Here's our little skateboard. This is a radius R. Um, here we have our little skateboard. Um, we are going to neglect friction. And we have, so we have motion constrained to the half pipe. And uh, I'm going to use our bright orange. We're going to draw our forces. If we neglect friction, we have two forces. We have gravity, and we have the normal force. Just like what we had when we, um, when we were dealing with the, um, the box sliding down the inclined plane, we have a constraint here. The skateboard is stuck in the half pipe. So because the skateboard is stuck in the half pipe, pipe there is no R hat um, net force. We can write our net force. This time, we are going to suffer through our discomfort. Uh, and I have to, I'm going to write my phi right here. We're going to suffer through our discomfort with polar coordinates because we're not nearly as comfortable with polar coordinates as we are with Cartesian coordinates. Even I, after all of these decades, I'm not as com comfortable with polar coordinates as Cartesian coordinates. I can write this normal force. Um, it has to be in the negative. So here, my R hat is pointing in this direction. Mm, R hat. My phi hat is in this direction. Uh, here I'm actually in the negative y direction, but my r hat is still this way. My phi hat is this way. R, is, r hat is always in the direction of increasing r. Phi hat is in the direction of increasing phi. So normal force is n r hat. Weight, here we have to draw some similar triangles. And this term right here is phi. So I can write my weight as mg cosine phi r hat. So if phi is, um, let's see here, if phi is 0, uh, let's see. 
Actually, this defines phi hat slightly different from the polar coordinates that we, I have to, if I use my x and my y, I'm going to try to follow what the book did, but x is here and y is there if I want to keep the r hat and phi hat that was defined in the book. So when cosine of theta, when theta is zero, um, then weight is all in the r hat direction. And then minus, uh, so we have m g cosine, or m g sine phi, so it's in the, we're going to, here, the weight is always, so it's going to be in the opposite of phi hat um, when you're up here. Um, so it is mg sine phi phi hat. And then if you go on this side, phi is negative. So um, sine of phi will be negative, and it's going to bring it back to the bottom. All right, then I add up my total force, and my total force is equal to mg cosine phi minus n in the r hat direction minus mg sine phi in the phi hat direction. Um, here I have two unknowns. I have the normal force and I have phi hat. Um, doesn't really matter what, so what I can say is this term has to go to zero because there is no motion in the r hat direction. So this is where it's much easier to write the constraint if you use polar coordinates than if you use uh, Cartesian coordinates. Because if you use Cartesian coordinates, then your constraint, writing your constraint is really ugly. Um, we would have to write the x squared plus y squared equals a constant and substitute variables in, and we'd solve for x and y. But you can see that the, this constraint is much easier to write in polar coordinates. OK, so then we can write this. We're going to take our polar coordinate expression for Newton's law. Here we have mgr phi uh, give me a little bit, give myself a little bit more space between these equations. Mg, negative mg phi dot squared. Here I'm using the constant r expression because I don't want to work harder than I have to. Um, plus m r phi double dot phi hat. Um, and I get two expressions. I get negative mr phi dot squared equals, ah, here, this is not, the net, well, sorry, the net force is not zero. I had made an error there. The, the constraint is this, but the answer is that n is going to be whatever solves that. Um, so the normal force changes depending on where you are, but it's always gonna it's always gonna make sure that your position is constant uh, in R. And then we have m r phi double dot equals m g sine phi um, in the phi hat direction. Um, and here I can make a, some cancellations. That M cancels out. Um, I dropped my negative sign when I copied that. Um, and I get that phi double dot plus G over R sine phi equals zero. You'll find that this actually looks very familiar. Um, if you remember the problem of a simple pendulum, 
The simple pendulum has very, a very similar description. You are constrained to act, uh, to, you, the motion is constrained in the, um, the motion is constrained to have the same length. Um, so instead of having a normal force here, you would have a tension, but you would actually have almost, you can just replace N by T and you would have this exact same free body diagram. Um, and this is, so here you have a second order uh, nonlinear differential equation because now you have a function of the, um, the angle that you're taking the derivative with respect to, so this is ugly. Um, and you can solve it numerically, but you cannot solve it exactly. Um, this is why in my class we're going to work on solving problems computationally so that you build up your skills so you know what to do. Um, we're going to work, what we can do analytically is work with a small angle approximation. All the stuff that you learned in calculus last year, you're going to use it this year. Um, if you had me for intro physics, you were using it already. So Taylor series, the Taylor series um, of a, a function, you can write that a function is approximately equal to the, that value's function at x naught plus f the first derivative times x minus x naught plus one half times the second derivative x minus x naught squared and so on and I can write this as the sum from n equals zero to infinity of f double prime x naught x minus x naught to the n over n factorial. Okay. So, Taylor series, you might have thought that this is something esoteric and not terribly useful when you took calculus. We use them all the time. Because in this class, we build your muscles for making approximations in a useful way. So, we're going to look at the small angle approximation. And if you look at, if you take the Taylor series of sine of phi, you will find that it is approximately equal, well, the Taylor series is phi minus phi cubed over 3 factorial plus phi to the fifth over 5 factorial minus and then so on. Um, what we're going to do now is simply take this first term and then we can solve the equation. Um, and what you can do later, so you can actually describe much of theoretical physics as taking a Taylor series and we start with the lowest non-zero term when that's no longer accurate enough for you, you move on and you just keep adding terms, maybe solving numerically. And now we're at the point where a lot of problems that can be solved analytically have probably been solved. So you start working numerically a lot. All right. So we're going to replace, this is where the small angle approximation comes in. And we always say sine of phi is approximately equal to phi. When you took intro physics, that may have seemed like magic. It's coming out of nowhere. It's not nowhere. It's coming out of the Taylor series. So phi double dot is roughly uh, equal to g over r phi for small angles. Uh, this has a solution. We're going to I'm going to erase some of my work here so that I can show you the solution. We're going to do a test solution. Now, here's where in a perfect world, well, you're sort of learning differential equations and vector calculus or relearning them or having your, these ideas solidified, also matrix algebra, while you're doing classical mechanics because these ideas are so useful for classical mechanics. And in fact, Classical mechanics is a good part of why the math was developed because 
we wanted to solve these problems. Now, the other side of that is that we worked really hard to solve these problems because people, because governments were paying to try to estimate trajectories better so that they could kill people better. We're no longer, you know, that's not why we're here today. But that is the history of it. All right, so now we have the solution. We're going to do a trial solution. We're going to see if we can put in x equals a cosine omega t plus phi, where a and phi are just constants. Um, and so we get a x dot, or actually we're going to put in We, let's do a change in, let's not call it A, we're going to call it phi, and let me call this, what's my favorite, well, C, why not do C? Um, it's hard to draw, it's hard to say. A omega sine omega t plus c is phi dot, phi double dot is negative a omega squared cosine omega t plus c. And now we're going to plug this in. So we get into this equation. We're going to see if this solves the problem. And we're going to see if we can identify what omega is and if there's any constraints on A and C. So we get A, negative omega, negative A omega squared cosine omega T plus C plus G over R A cosine omega T plus C equals zero. All right. Now we have an A and a cosine omega C everywhere. So we can cancel them out because no matter what these values are, um, that equation holds. So we get negative omega squared plus G over R equals zero. Or this is a good trial solution if omega squared equals g over r. So then, what do we do here? Um, if we want to solve this exactly and solve it for all possible um, problems, this is our initial amplitude. What is the initial, not, the initial displacement in terms of degrees? And uh, this is the initial phase. So if I start at... Uh, if I start at zero degrees and with some velocity, um, I can, that's going to fix this at zero, uh, and this is going to, or sorry, not, if I start at zero degrees, that's the opposite. This has some value because you want phi, to, so phi of, uh, you want phi to be zero, so you would, you'd have to set this a little differently. Basically, you're going to, if you're given some initial conditions, you have to be given phi of zero and phi dot of zero. That is going to fix A and C. Now, I'm going to leave this for a later chapter, but you also can describe these solutions as exponentials of complex numbers. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to cover complex numbers in a little bit. Um, you could instead write this as a e to the i, e to the plus or minus i omega t. Um, you'd get the same omega. i here is the square root of negative 1. You also could describe this as phi equals a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. And sometimes this version is more useful than that. 
These are all different ways of saying the same thing because there's something beautiful. Euler's equation. Euler has a lot of equations. Which relates an exponent of an imaginary number, an exponent of e to the i. So e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So these are all different ways of writing the same thing. Um, you may find that these two, at least initially, are the most comfortable for you, um, and that's okay. We are going to throw you into the wild world of complex analysis and make you work with imaginary numbers. But for now, we're going to wrap this chapter up, and I'll see you for the next one.